Welcome to Star Guys, a podcast about Stargirl on DC Universe and the CW. And if you're flying high, you might be a star guy. I'm one of those guys what? who's flying high. I'm Alex. That's that's fun. And I'm another guy who is blinking his eye, winking his eye. That's it. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> Pete, what's your uh, fun rhyme? Uh, I'm I'm Pete and I'm drunk. I'm Pete. <laughs> you're Pete and you can't be beat. And your feet hit the street. You're one of the no. star guys. And we're going to be talking about the fourth episode of season one of Stargirl Wildcat. So game on. Let's get into it. Uh, Don't fake excited. the funk on a nasty drunk. Pete. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the exciting news, I think, beyond this episode being very good, and this is my whoa, favorite. Whoa, whoa. What? Nah. Nah, B. Not be? This one is not uh, not good. Oh, I know why you think it's not good, but oh, uh, really? Yes. Oh, you already know. Oh, because I'm... of the sexual assault themes. Oh no, no, oh. no. Oh, okay. You usually feel very that uncomfortable was the with the bad that. effects of trying to climb a wall, and you shouldn't you shouldn't put stuff in a TV show that looks that awful. Oh, my God. Wow. wow. Pete coming hard for the effects right at the top. I disagree with you on that. Uh, the other reason... Oh, you, that you thought it looked cool the way it was clearly her just shooting on the floor and making it look like she's climbing up a yeah, wall. Come or on. Or the shot where it's clearly wired. I mean, come on. It's Batman 66, dude. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to go campy, do that. But you can't have everything bad ups. Badass, and then like, ooh. Well, hold on. I will say, somebody pointed this uh, to us on Twitter, and I think they're absolutely correct. Last episode, there was the whole bus scene on the bridge, and that was a clear homage to Superman, the movie. Mm -hmm. This, her climbing up the wall, I think to Justin's point, is a tribute. It is an homage to Batman 66 and all of these other things. And they clearly are trying to work out all of these superhero tropes and all of these visual identifiers so it was into to look the like episode. Crap. They were. You're being very mean right here at the top, drunk beat. Uh, yeah. But I think it was supposed to make you fondly recall that show, and for me, it worked. Yeah, it's a stylistic Aww. choice. It's like a gesture that I think. Uh, I agree. I think I thought it worked, especially when. This whole episode was so, like, fun and light. Like, it was, like, super dark and intense um, for a lot of it. And just, like, the mean things, the horrible things that people do to each other. And on the other side, it was, like, very lighthearted and just, like, two people becoming friends while they also learn about how they have cool superpowers. Yeah. I mean, something that I'll mention, uh, two things I'll actually mention. The first one about them becoming friends. Um, this is a random interview that I read with Breck Bassinger. I honestly don't remember who did it, uh, but she it was me. It was I, I was going to say it was definitely you. <laughs> it was me, yeah. but I was trying to get around it and then I felt weird about lying about it. I'm it's not trying to flex. own the flex, bro. Yeah. Own Alex, the, the reverse flex is still a flex. Yeah, don't try to fucking, and then you have to bail because you painted yourself into a corner. Yeah, so, I just don't you know, like just lying to the people. You lifted up your kilt anyway, like we all knew you were going. To <laughs> and all I got down there is bagpipes, buddies. Oh, so she was talking about which I thought was really fun. Um, she was living in Atlanta with all the other members of the JSA, or at least she was living with Vet Montreal, who plays Wildcat, and a couple of the other uh, girls on the cast. And so they knew each other. And then they get to set and they'd have no scenes together. So we talked a little bit about this episode and she said it was so much fun because they already had this rapport and she, and I think this comes through on screen. She could not contain herself the entire time. She was just so excited to be finally be working with her friends in an episode. And I think that's part of what in my mind makes this episode so fun is you really can't fake that excitedness. It feels for the first time to me, like the Courtney from the comic books brought forward on screen in exactly the right way. Yeah, I agree. Like, it's really fun that they took the classic, like, Ocean's Eleven, get the gang together style montage and spread it. They're spreading out over a bunch of episodes. I think that's super Mm -hmm. fun and smart. And it lets us have all the fun. 
um, for a lot of the season, which I think speaks to the character. The character is this like bright, a little bit reckless with um, like, for instance, saying your secret identity name and uh, your partner's name out loud um, in the middle of a thing. Um, I think that feels, I like that. That's, it feels fresh to me. That's original. Like a lot of other superhero shows, it's, they, Guard or it gives other enemy. people heart attacks because it's like Any, anybody could hear you. Stop! What are you doing? That's Don't be you so reckless. Yeah. Um, uh, the yeah. other thing that I wanted to mention that I think is pretty exciting about this episode, from a comic book nerd perspective, which we all are, it's directed by Rob Hardy, but more excitingly, it's written by James Dale Robinson, who is better known as James Robinson, who is one of the co-creators of Jack Knight Starman, along yes. with Tony Moore. It's not Harris. Tony Moore. Tony Harris. Tony Harris. Thank you. I always mix up the two Tonys, as I like to call oh, them. And as we say, they are only two Tonys. Yes, yeah, there's he also there's is more a Tony's. driving force behind not this iteration of the JSA, but certainly the iteration of the JSA that inspired a lot of the show. And he was brought onto the writing staff by Jeff Johns um, because he felt like this show would not work without him. Now, James Robinson has not written a lot of TV or movies. In fact, he wrote... Oh, my God, I'm blanking on the name. It's uh, Comic Book Heroes or something like that about the two feuding comic book store owners with Donald Lug and DJ Qualls uh, that people liked. It's kind of a cult classic. And then he also wrote the script for League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, the movie adaptation, which everybody uniformly hates. And he Uh, basically... What? Not everybody hates. (laughs) Hold... So you're going to spend the first five minutes of the podcast slamming a, a tribute to Batman 66 and then say you like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, the movie? That's right. Pete is. He's always swimming upstream. You never quite know what this little salmon's going to end up saying. Yeah. It's a sweet car they got in that movie. That's cool. Everyone's okay. favorite part. Yeah. Regardless, other than Pete, a lot of people did not love that movie, and James Robinson has not really written for the screen since then. Uh, He also has not written a lot of comic books in the past couple of years. Um, He wrote, oh gosh, I'm blanking. He wrote a a Shade spinoff of Starman. He also did a run on Wonder Woman, I think, which was all right. I think that's correct as well. He did a a creator-owned comic that I think was called Sky Boy, where was very oh, auto- right. autobiographical. Um, so he he's a he's a interesting he's had an interesting trajectory, and he's very yeah. public with his struggles with like just relationships and managing uh, the stress of being a writer and like yelling at people and like not being in control of his emotions um, and a lot of the back matter to the Starman omnibuses. So I think he's just someone who you never quite know what he's going to do. But I thought this episode was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Other, we didn't get you, we didn't get Mike. Mikey didn't deliver on this episode. There was oh no Mikey. Like he got a little bit of a pop tart song, but then I mean, it was all of a sudden they forgot how to use what was comic gold up until this point. That he got his shtick out there. He was like, no. "Hey, yeah. hey, I'm Rodney Dangerfield." Pretty much, I like sugar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob, you know where the pop tarts are, right? I don't get oh, no yeah, pop yeah, tarts. Yeah. Hey, what are we having yeah. for lunch? <laughs> hey, mom, we're all gonna get laid. <laughs> Ladybugs. Uh, Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, we'll talk before we talk about the full episode. Let's talk about the recap of what's happened so far. Um, but I do want to say I agree with you, Justin. I loved the writing of this episode. I thought some of the choices were so smart. And this is, I think, my favorite thing that James Robinson has done in years. So I was very, very pleased with the episode. I did think, though, it was great to get somebody else on her team. Yeah. I, I did think that was exciting. Yeah. And I like Yolanda as a character. I was just, you know. Really well done in this episode, especially when I like the way that in the first three episodes we see her and she just feels like such an outsider and uh, upset. And then we get the story and you see the sort of the bright, happy version of her uh, juxtaposed with how upset she is because of what happened. It's just really smartly done. But more importantly, we finally get a Beth payoff that's going to move forward. uh, And I'm excited about that. She's going to make a great Green Lantern. 
<laughs> Don't well, get me started on the oh, the junk. The, she's just looking at stuff in a bed, picking up a green lamp. I just be careful. What are you hold, doing? Hold on, hold on. You were jumping so far ahead at this point. I was yeah. trying to just kind of lightly set up the episode, but we're already halfway through it. Real quick recap: Courtney Whitmore has moved to Blue Valley, Nebraska, with her mom Barbara, her adorably hilarious stepbrother Mikey, and her stepdad Pat. Pat was a sidekick back in the day, named Stripesy for the Justice Society of America, who were killed ten years ago by. The Injustice Society of America. The Injustice Society of America, as we have discovered, moved to Blue Valley, Nebraska, and started something called Project New America. We don't know exactly what's up quite yet, but clearly they have a vision for America. They have a vision for the world that they want to put forward. And the first step of that plan is this idyllic small town of Blue Valley. It's actually interesting now, uh, the because uh, the, the business is American Dream, and their s- sort of evil plan is Project New America. Curious, what does American Dream do other stuff? Like what? It's weird that they have two different, very similar names for those things. Right. Uh, just uh, American Dream runs Project New America, and they also buy a ton of scratchers for everybody every week. I mean, that's how that's how you run the town. Are you taking shots at scratchers too? No, up? I'm not. Pete, Why? you above I'm, scratchers? Y- yeah, <laughs> wow. I think so. I love wow. a scratch off. Yeah, man. Uh, not a great gift. Not a great Christmas gift, but other, otherwise. Oh, it's no, fun- it's a great Christmas gift because it's like, hey, man, maybe you. It's not. I mean, <laughs> if they win, it's an amazing Christmas yeah, gift. Yeah, but then you what? regret it as the gift giver. I feel like that's a like an old Seinfeld bit or an old you, stand-up bit I've heard where it's like it's the worst gift. You giving the gift? What's that? If someone won a million dollars, you would regret giving them that gift? I think many people would be like, I wish I scratched that scratch off. No, but you give it to them hoping they're going to win. You don't give it to them going, you better not win, you fucking asshole. No one says you better not win, but what are you, the fucking lottery Santa Claus over here? Uh, I feel like you're either giving them a piece of garbage paper that is worth nothing or a million dollars, and you're like, oof, I should have kept that for myself. Wow. Well, that's insane philosophy there. Then why give it if that's the way you're going to be? Right, that's what he's saying. Don't give it. Yeah, give it something nice, like a gift. I'm disagreeing. I'm saying giving somebody a million dollars is a nice gift. Well, I think that pretty well recaps what's happened previously <laughs> on Summer Girl. <laughs> so uh, he's Stripesy. He moves to Blue Valley with his family. Uh, he's also brought a couple of things for the JSA there, including a cosmic staff that Courtney picks up. She becomes Stargirl, a new superhero. Uh, thinking she is living up to the legacy of her father, Starman. She doesn't 100% know that her father is Starman, uh, but that's well, certainly what she... that's confirmed in this episode by the Cosmic Rod. No. No. No, it lights up and agrees with her when she's telling the truth, and that was clear. What do you the speak? Cosmic- you speak Rod? Yeah, I speak Rod now. <laughs> I don't think you do. Roddies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the rod was clearly in agreement with her. And then when she was wrong, when she was going to go to a hospital and shut off all the power, because that's a great thing to do. The rod you are was just like, blasting no. through all the plot points. You hate the recap and you have now extended it to upwards of 13 minutes. I've Let's been just... trying to be good and let you go through it. But Justin keeps stopping you and bringing up angry points. That's yeah, what these happening. are angry points. He's trying to turn the recap into a cap. And that's that's <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> yeah, why don't you just cap off the recap so we can get yeah, going? Yeah, I'll just finish up pretty, pretty briefly. Uh, so <laughs> Courtney has gone to this new school. She's encountered a couple of people there. Pete earlier mentioned Beth, who is a big nerd who loves her parents. Uh, there's also uh-huh. Yolanda, who seems pretty moody. Uh, last episode, we saw somebody had written slut on her locker. And Cindy, the mean girl at school, seems to have it in for her. We find out a little bit more about this this episode. Episode. The other thing that you should probably know that's pretty important to this episode is in the first episode, Courtney blew up the car of one uh, Henry, a.k.a. Brainwave Jr., the son of Brainwave, one of the members of the Injustice Society of America. In the second episode, she battled Brainwave and sent him into a coma. He's been in a coma. Uh, his son has been visiting well, at the hospital. The Cossack They've- Rod kind of did that. I mean, she was, you know. Again, you do not speak Rod. You don't know that. Talk to the Rod. Uh, the, how yeah. your your Rod Duolingo? Um, how's that going? It's good. Yeah, Let him finish streak. the recap. 
Uh, I actually think that's probably all you need to know. Everything else will kind of come up naturally in the episode. So why don't we get into it? Uh, It does start off, as Justin mentioned, with this montage sequence. We get to see Yolanda. She's totally different than we've seen her before. She's happy. Three months prior. Three months prior. She's happy. She's cheery. She's running for student president. There's vote Yolanda. Her whole family loves her. Whole family loves her. And... She's dating Henry, a.k.a. Brainwave Jr., which is an interesting twist. Yes, didn't Uh, see that coming. In the middle of this, she's home, he starts texting her, and he wants nudes. And she (laughs) gives it to him. (laughs) This scene, I was like, they they do a good job with the music, having it, keeping it like, oh, this mm -hmm. is just a thing. Um, But man, it was, did not feel good about this. Focused on her face the whole time. Um, uh, this really sucked because this asshole took advantage of her niceness, but it wasn't even him. It was evil. What's her face? And I don't know how the technology works, but she just like touched his phone and all of a sudden she had the pictures. Did you guys get that? Like he just, she just like looked at his phone. <laughs> yeah. For she a had second. one of those phones that you can bump together and transfer pictures. You yep. know, the ones from oh. like, 2005 or whatever it was. They were really popular in 2005 and also three months ago. Oh, okay. It, it, he had his phone. She looked at it, and then all of a sudden she had all of the info. No. Uh, what I actually think happened was, first of all, he was being kind of a dick because he was clearly showing the picture to his buddies. She grabbed the yeah. phone, texted it to herself, and then she sent it to the rest of the school. That's what I took well, away from that. They're both wow, bad. really? Texted to her, like... She held it, and then he grabbed it back, and you think she was able to do that in that time. Fast thumbs. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's why they call it super fast power. thumbs. If this girl becomes one of the chosen, I'm fucking walking. I don't think so. Fuck this girl. That is so yeah. ridiculous what she did to her. Well, considering we know what she becomes from the comic book, no, that's not going to happen. There it is. But we won't give spoilers based on any of that. Uh, I think I really like the way um, Yolanda uh, played this moment when she was taking the picture. You can almost see on her face, I'm going to regret this as she's mm-hmm. doing it. Like, it was a great mix of like, oh, I like this guy. I want to do what he's asking me to. But also like, I'm not comfortable with this and I feel bad about it. Like, it was yeah. well played. Well, that's the thing. Like, you know. If you're not comfortable doing something, you shouldn't feel pressure. And she was definitely pressuring him, which is not fucking cool. And then he... He was pressuring her, not she was pressuring him. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm just clarifying. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the booze gets in the way. But the... uh, (laughs) what's, What's even more heartbreaking is that, like, it just is never... It just, oh, this happens, and then there's no conversation about it they just kind of move on and it would be nice and i hope that happens later hopefully after she's like all trained up wild sky styles and like punches the shit out of him you know what i mean a little boxing but he's the bag well oh, i wow. mean that's the point of the episode like that's you know, her hopefully she's episode. gonna speed bag his nuts later is my point <laughs> yes i don't i don't think she's gonna speed bag his nuts i mean this is jumping <laughs> ahead but she makes a decision when she can make a move on him not to do that and take a different road. And I think ultimately, like she talks about towards the end of the episode, it's more about her figuring out who she is independent of this thing that happened to her. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it's tough. It's a tough thing to kind of lightly deal with in a show like this. Um, I don't think it was lightly dealt with. I think it was actually pretty heavy, honestly. The speech that she gives to Courtney about midway through was very well acted and very rough to watch, but in exactly the right way. And uh, while we're just talking about this whole thing, like the way that her family treats her, like I thought that was fucking, uh, I was surprised how harsh it went and then sustained. Uh, And that really added a lot. Um, yeah, so. especially after her uh, her kind of speech to her family, like she's and like, oh, I just love that moment before. Like, I got to do me first, then I could wildcat it up, which I was like, oh, that's that's very healthy. Focus on yourself, feel good about yourself and then become a superhero and whoop a ton of ass. Uh, but then she gives the speech and the family is just cold as ice. Yeah, yeah, they're willing to sacrifice. Uh, mm-hmm. So in the present day. 
Courtney, as Pete mentioned, has all the artifacts just laid out on her bed that she stole from JSA headquarters. Last episode, she's looking over them, grabs the Thunderbolt, which is a pen, and presses it, and it doesn't work. So she gets fed up and throws it into her pen holder. What's up, Pete? Well, before that, she casually picks up uh, the Green Lantern lantern. And it's just kind of just staring. Does that bother anybody else? The way she's casually uh, just kind of putting things in a duffel no. bag that are very powerful, uh, uh, not toys that shouldn't just be thrown in a duffel bag under her bed. And uh, just using a pen, even though she was told it was uh, a thunder lightning pen and that she shouldn't <laughs> click it and then just went to town like clicking it like mad. It didn't bother anybody else? No. I like... Cool, cool, I, cool, cool, I like, cool, cool. again, I said this earlier, I like her recklessness and her just sort of like, yeah, I'm going to try this stuff out. It feels like her uh, sort of... She thinks it's her birthright because she thinks Starman's her dad. We're going to find that out. Um, okay, cool. And I sort of... So just... She's just the, to follow up... She's okay. the generational heir to this stuff because she made it that... Made her in self into that. And I think it's going to be good. So just uh, real quick to follow up... Uh, if you, you know, uh, teach your uh, children about, uh, you know, things that are right and wrong and then your daughter's handling explosives and you're like, hey, don't don't handle explosives. They're bad for you. And then she like blows up uh, some things and you're like, you know what? I appreciate how reckless you were and how, uh, you know, yeah, what you just said, basically. Is it a, a, an exploding pen? Like a fun pen? Yeah, it's a fun, like a giggling, pen? exploding pen. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the kind of parent wow. I am. Well, you know what? I appreciate you for standing by your uh, what you said, so I'm <laughs> impressed. That's right. Uh, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, now, also, I'll mention a little note. I think this came up on the bonus podcast, but in the comic books, the Thunderbolt, which is the pen, uh, is... And this is the thing that Courtney doesn't know. It's activated by a keyword. In the comics, we weren't sure how to pronounce it, but it's actually Say You. We were told this by Mike Badecki. Say on- Me. Say you, uh, and because Mike, Mike Bedecke on Twitter mentioned the whole bit at the beginning, apparently, was Johnny Thunder would accidentally all the time be like, say you do this thing, and yeah. then it would activate the genie, and the genie would go nuts and wreck all this shit. So we'll see if they do the same sort of thing on the show, but it's a fun little setup, particularly like throwing it in the uh, pen holder there, you know it's going to come up again at some point. Well, and didn't Mikey mention that he was having his friend over for dinner, whose name is uh, Jakeem? Yeah, Jakeem Thunder. There you go. Makes a lot of sense that he's going to maybe find that pen. Ooh. It's interesting because you'd expect that Mikey would be the character to find it, but... It'll be nice to bring in another character and still just keep Mikey on his own show. He's got Mikey's yeah. world oh, going. He's man. good to go. Mikey is too busy to be a superhero. He's doing a weekend at the Chuckle Hut in Newark, so he <laughs> he can't he can't be a hero. Oh man, he's opening he for would Mike destroy at the Chuckle Hut. Yeah, yeah. I work for Pop Tarts. <laughs> uh, so she hides all the artifacts, uh, and then Mikey, we get our great Pop Tart bit. He just wants pop tarts. Wait, uh, wait, pe- wait! We got to okay, back up the truck here and talk course. a little we bit about really, the. <laughs> this truck hasn't right? moved forward much. Let me be honest. <laughs> yeah, we got to talk about the uh, Barb and Pat kiss because that was adorbs. All right, Amy Smart, <laughs> Luke Wilson. I mean, that's that was that was real. That was some that was some beautiful moments. It is right there. It is fun because you identify so much with Luke Wilson and you love Amy smart unabashedly <laughs> that I feel like this was a real moment for you. Did you, guys you kind didn't... of like, uh, put yourself in the same blocking as Luke Wilson on the screen so that it looked like you were kissing Amy smart. Check I mean, that TV. I there's the there's definitely, and I'm like morning Barb. There's definitely a lip. <laughs> there's definitely a lip print on uh, Pete's TV right now for sure. And if Pete, if you were in the movie Avatar, I think you would Avatar into Luke Wilson's body. And for the show, yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, any <laughs> other instances of Luke Wilson or just the show? No, just, just so because Amy Smart is his wife in the show. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Great. This is, is uh, creepy. Uh, so yep. we get the pop chart bit. Uh, we also get a little bit of talk about how Mikey wants to bring his friend over for dinner. As we mentioned, Courtney's like, yeah, I also have friends. Ha ha. But nobody believes her. Pete, what's your question? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Like I'm sorry. 10 seconds. But, 
you, you know, he brings up an interesting point. Um, cookies and cream, favorite Pop Tart flavor? I don't know about that, guys. Come on, this kid's unbelievable. That's too, I mean, I mean it's I'm firmly on it. Like, it's too it's, much sugar. No, no, it's the brown sugar cinnamon is the best one, best flavor. That, Pop-Tart. That's true. Yes, I agree. Wow. Justin, uh, again, I think I said you could give us a speech about how your mom didn't let you have sugar and then yes. you didn't. Okay. We only had we had the sort of more wholesome pop tarts that were like just the filling. And we didn't wow. have all the frosted ones, and we mostly wow. ate like grape nuts. <laughs> Our big treat was frosted mini wheats. Oh, uh, man. I kind of had the same thing. I mean, we only shopped at organic supermarkets, and the only thing I really ate for breakfast for years was amaranth crunch. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Pat Oswalt, they didn't make that up. That's a real. That's the real name. That is a real thing. Oh, uh, man. And then when I got to college, I was like, Pop Tarts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so, if you world. eat enough amaranth crunch, then you be, you go clear and become the uh, <laughs> you become a, a full. I, I started to be able to see God, but He didn't talk back to me. Wow, oh, man! Check your thetans, man. <laughs> Where were we? Okay, well, let me so say. Cool. So we have oh, this. She God. has all these items. No, I, this is about the show. Um, she yeah, has okay. all these items, and it's clear from these series of interactions. She's like, okay, time to pick some random people at my high school to become superheroes. Yeah, she's paging through the yearbook. I was like, that's not how you do this. Now, I I think this is so funny. Like, she has to do it by her own uh, choice. If you were in her position. How many heroes do you think were available to you in your high school? Oh, my God. Uh, a half, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's so funny to me that this is the plot point. And then the, the scene with Pat that we're just getting to, where he's basically like, hey, uh, don't ask random teens to be heroes, uh, please. And she's like, I don't give a fuck what you say that. Can't help it, sorry. Hey, I, I mean, I think that... Get out of here. There's kind of a sense of like, and I think this is what they're playing off of here. The thing that makes it work because it is just on the edge of ludicrous is she's just playing on like, yeah, this is the destiny. Of course, these people are going to be here the same way I became this hero. All of these other people have to be here to be these heroes as well. And of course, she is going to find them and they are going to become these heroes. So we know intrinsically as an audience, it's going to work. Yeah. Wow. I did not know that. I was just like, you can't choose heroes in a, in a yearbook. It's not how things work. You think she's going to find Wildcat and they'll be like, well, that's it. Junk yeah. the rest of the artifacts. Let's see. Yep. Who should be Green Lantern? How about this guy that said, wine me, dine me, 69 me in my yearbook? <laughs> <laughs> he seems what? like he's got a real will, willpower. Oh, my God. I, don't, I didn't <laughs> like that joke. Made me uncomfortable. That's a very uh, popular thing to write in a yearbook, or at least it was with a bunch of shitheads in my school. Oh, so wow. she, she is looking for the recruits. She sees Yolanda was a boxer. Um, meanwhile, Cindy, there's a bunch of stuff that happens in the hallway. She sort of hooks into, like, Yolanda's going to be my wildcat. Uh, Cindy wants to talk to Henry. He ignores her. She immediately turns around, yells at Yolanda. We see all of these dynamics playing out. Uh, but Yolanda just wants to be left alone. She doesn't want anything to do with Courtney. At this point, we turn over to another character that we've seen a little bit of. Uh, one of the members of the Injustice Society, William Zarek, was killed last episode along with his son, leaving his wife, Denise. Denise, all alone, Denise brings her car by Pat's shop, and Pat, I think, whiffs this very oh. hard. <laughs> yeah. he, he whiffs. All Pat does in this episode is whiff. Yeah. Like, the wizard's wife is like... Uh, first off, he started off on fire, you know what I mean? Him yeah. and Bob had a morning, uh, you know, a morning of mornings, if you will. Yeah. And, you know, it can all be downhill after that because he gets to go home to Amy Smart. So maybe maybe it. we can talk about all these Pat scenes, actually, because they sort of stand alone uh, away from everything else. Uh, Wizard's wife comes by Pat's garage and is like, hey, I'm having a hard time. He's like, I'm sorry. I know you've your son and, and husband died. And she's like, I have to go. She comes back yeah. later and she's like, yeah, I, I'm leaving town. I got to take all this wizard stuff out of town. Because of wizard, my son was a wizard, and my dad, my husband was a wizard. So, and Pat's like really tapping his head 
Like, huh, this is a real clue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think well, there are some parts of the episode where they dub down the characters ever so slightly, particularly when it comes to stuff like this, where, like, Pat is just not getting it at all. I'm with uh, that sad because literally Stargirl was like, yeah, villains live here. And he's like, villains live here? Hmm. Yeah. And well, this is the same thing that happened it. the last episode, almost to the point where it's a bit where he went in and he was like, oh, Brainwave, he was brought in by uh, somebody? And they were like, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, of course. And he was like, yeah, oh, but he, there's he was able to them. get it. Oh, he, wow. He I, I like it. I like his moves. It's yeah. fun. It's endearing. He's carrying on. And it really makes sense that someone who uh, is that sort of um, unable to follow up on a clue was the is the father of Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> I found his way around there somehow to make that dude. So uh, Denise is like, listen, this town is terrible. Don't trust anybody yeah. here. And he's like, what? What do you mean? I don't yeah. know what's going on. And then by the end of the episode, he's going to wait. The wait, was he an old prospector? Is that what that voice is? No, it was still like uh, what's his name, Jimmy Stewart. Dude, Jimmy Stewart. And I was about to say James Cagney, but that was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's Jimmy Stewart. Wow, there man, are only two that's James. A topical ref. <laughs> uh, he still doesn't quite get it uh, Goes to the junkyard later uh, Dude is like, hey, what are you working on? You working on a time machine? And he's like, ha ha ha, no, I'm working on a giant robot I mean, nothing, a car uh, Goes to looks back and he sees Denise's car, totally wrecked oh, Her cat's wandering around Everything's in there Broke it open and it turns out There Can might be you? other villains in Blue Valley Pat's starting to put it all together it's not quite why, there yet. Why would the cat go to the car wreck? You know what I mean? Like, why didn't the cat go to, to the home? Or, like, you know what I mean? Like, why did the cat stay with the car? It's like captain in a ship. The cat always goes down with the car. Yeah. Because hmm. hmm. uh, cat is short for captain. It's just, it's <laughs> right. just the P is missing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought this ending of the episode was, like, really, again, like, sort of dark and uh, had this just... That it was, was a dark s- ending. It was very subtly told as well, which I thought was... Because it's like, I want to believe that she got the wand and is like, I'm a wizard and maybe fucked up the car and was like, I'm out. But it was like, it kind of looked like a really fucked up accident. Yeah, I'm sure one of the the villains killed her and stopped Ooh. her from leaving. Um, I think we're going to see the wizard... Maybe- I mean, just to throw it out there, is it possible that the cat ate her while she was driving? Ooh, that could be the old cat eating. Well, and let's the scene we're sort of coming up on in the progression is um, the scene underneath American Dream in the head Injustice Society headquarters, where we've got this uh, terrifying Doctor Serpent or whatever. He's like, "Hey, can I have <laughs> that dude's body? <laughs> hey, so are you done with that body, man?" Uh, so this is Dragon King is the name of the character. Uh, of he's a member of the Justice Society. Uh, what I liked about this dynamic is we've had literally one episode with Icicle being the big bad. And immediately we meet somebody worse than Icicle. Like yeah. That was the impression that I took away from it to the point where Icicle is even clearly scared of him. Uh and that's great. Like, I love yep. up dig that dynamic so quickly. Uh, but, yeah, he mentions an important detail you might want to hold on to is he says he's visiting his daughter in town. Um, he's building yes. a machine. We don't know what the machine is. Uh, and as mentioned, he wants the wizard's body. Um, and it's interesting. That's kind of all we get of the villains in this episode, though. It was good scene. I They do the- such a good job of making these villains intimidating. Yeah, yeah, they really do. And, like, it was one thing where, like, sometimes you you kind of go, don't get to see what's under the mask. Like, sometimes you, there's an amazing makeup job. That's how, and you really that's don't how masks get to, work. Well, it's yeah, but up. they did such a great job of, like, giving us enough of what's underneath the mask to be like, holy shit, this is a fucked up lizard person or he's whatever. Got a, he's got a separate mask under there. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Well, oh. you know, they say the beards are the original mask. <laughs> uh, so back to the show Yolanda is boxing Courtney needs her help Of Still Yolanda She's wants not to- just boxing There's a lot of anger behind those punches Which I appreciated 
Yes, she is working shit out, yeah. uh, but still wants nothing to do with her. Courtney invites her over for dinner, gives her a number. She doesn't want to do it. Um, but then Take a Yol- hint. Yolanda goes back, talks to her mom, and oh. is like, Ugh. hey, I I maybe can't. I can go out to the dinner. And she's like, no, you're grounded forever, basically. Forever. <laughs> forever. Yeah. Uh, so she doesn't show up, but Courtney looks through the yearbook, figures out what's been going on, confronts Yolanda, explains that she blew up Henry's car. So her technique is to be like, yeah. hey, you hate this dude? Guess what? I blew up his car. Let's hang That's out. That's a pretty good opener, though. It is. Like, hey, I blew up Henry's car. You should, like, talk to me. And then she gives a beautiful, heartbreaking speech about everything that's gone on with her. And it's pretty, like I said earlier, I thought pretty wonderfully shot and directed and acted yeah. and written and everything. I like this quite a bit. Yeah, I agree. This is great. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was very touching. Uh, and it ends with a great line from Courtney where she says, hey, wh- you want to see what I did with his car? Yeah. Uh, which, very fun. She uh, said, do you want to see how I blew up his car? Yeah, do you want to see how I blew up his car? Sorry, I might have written it quickly. It's I a, apologize. Okay. Uh, so then immediately Courtney shows the staff to Yolanda. And I do, hold on. So I know we talked at the beginning of the episode about like how she's just being very reckless with anything. But this Way feels. Way too cash. This feels very true to being a teenager. You have yes. a cosmic staff. You want to make a friend. You're going to show off your awesome cosmic staff and all the cool things you can exactly. do. Exactly. When you have something cool, it's like if you saw a dead body down by the railroad tracks, you'd be like, yo, you guys want to come see the dead body down by the railroad tracks? No, mm-hmm. no, no. Guys, Superhero 101, with, when you're wearing a mask and you have a secret identity... You've got to keep it a secret. You can't just be like, I'm lonely. Who wants to see my cosmic staff? I mean, she might as well hand out flyers in the goddamn what are fucking you doing? lunch. Are you punching room. your microphone right now? That's my knee. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I understand it, it's breaking a lot of sort of superhero trope rules, but that's what yeah, I like about this show. As a nerdy person, it hurts that she's discarding years of how things work to be like, nah, I'm reckless. Fuck all this shit. I'll tell anybody who comes in a radius of me. I don't care if Mike overhears. I don't, I'm going to leave a toaster around. I don't give a fuck. But this, again, it feels very true to like, Courtney is over eager to have a friend. Yolanda is a little unsure about it. And that plays out through check out my cool cosmic staff. Then, Hey, let's go get dressed in crazy costumes and hang out. And it's great. Like it feels like to me, this actually is very pure superhero because this is what a superhero show should be. It should be the superheroics over a level of metaphor for normal human interaction. But what about the rule of, like, anytime you yell out loud, hey, it's just you and me in this house, that's never the case. But that was actually the case. But I, I, what I love about it, to your point, Alex, is it feels like this show doesn't follow the, like, superhero origin, like, playbook, like so many other superhero TV shows and movies do. Like, we've seen it so many times. This show, it feels organic. It feels like they are actually figuring it out. Like, they, in a minute, like, in a, a couple scenes from where we are now, like, after Yolanda's tried the Wildcat outfit on, they're like, oh, um... Let's Google what her power, the Wikipedia. Wildcat's powers are, Wiki, Wikipedia Wildcat's powers. Like, I thought that was so fun. Like, the fact that they have no idea, they're like, this website says that Wildcat used to be able to do this. Can you do that? Yeah. Like, hey, it says you should jump off a building. Why don't we go do that? It says it right here. I thought that moment of her on the top of the building was a great cap to this, like, fun montage of them playing around and... It really serious. brought back the emotional undertone of the character and this like this sort of challenge. It brought everything together to such a fine point so concisely. Uh, it was I thought that was such a great sort of crescendo. It of this was episode. really cool, and then kind of later, unfortunately, a little bit ruined by we didn't get to see the superhero landing. All we saw was a shot from the point of view of the grass, where there was grass and then shoes. And we didn't get to see the superhero landing. It was just a cool look at my glowing shoes moment. Most of the show, though, is told from the point of view of the grass. And I appreciated the fact that we were finally (laughs) recognizing that in the middle of the show. 
Pete, I think you need to spend more time really living like grass lives. <laughs> like can that reconnect? You need to be more grounded. You need to mm-hmm. get more sun. You need Ooh, okay. to w- water yourself a little bit. <laughs> uh, by the way, Justin, I, I apologize, Justin. I, I forgot to get you the check for this month for your ashram. Uh, can I turn it in late, or am I out for this month? Uh, no, you're you're 100 percent in. You're 100 percent in. <laughs> Money's meaningless. Uh, yeah, uh, Justin runs this amazing ashram. Pete, you should really join it. It's uh, all about being like the grass. Be the grass, it's man. Deep, man. Steve. I guess I'm sort of giving it all away here, but yeah, be the grass. <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm, I'm, more, I'm sure I'm more we charge a, for this podcast. I'm yeah. more of a Bruce Lee guy, you know, be the water. Mm. Interesting. We should get together. We could really yeah. grow. Uh, so <laughs> as we mentioned, uh, she gets the Wildcat costume as soon as she puts on the helmet. It form fits to her body. She feels what like it's was... kind of tight. I, yes, Pete. <laughs> okay, so what? So we need to talk about what Wildcat's powers are before the show and what they kind of made Wildcat's powers into. Well, hold into on. Before we do that, we're going to have a bonus podcast. Yeah, We should go up after the CW airing. Oh, that's a great plug. Let's do that. Yeah, let's uh, let's hold it. Let's talk more about Wildcat in the history I'll of Wildcat. I'll just put that in the Favorite pocket. Wildcat stories, et cetera. Kind of hold on to that for there. Suffice to say... This is pretty original for the show. This isn't exactly true to the comic books, uh, but we do find out she can uh, pop out these Wolverine-style claws and slash a toaster. She can land on her feet. She can walk on a fence like a cat. And a wild cat. fitting costume. Yes. And uh, Mikey, as we mentioned, uh, tries to use the toaster, but it's all slashed up, and he can't have his Pop-Tarts. Oh, oh, Mikey. Uh, Mikey. Here's the thing. I, I don't like Mikey. Hey, fuck you for saying that. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't say that. You don't say that out loud. No. I'm just saying. I don't, I'm not trying to say, like, oh, Pete's what, opinion. What is we, it about Mikey you don't like? I don't like the Pop-Tarts. All he thinks about, he's selfish. He only thinks about food. He's fuck trying, you. Trying he's to get a his, kid, man. All, they're all, there's a lot of kids in this show, and they have other stuff going on besides where he's getting his next little sugar Dude. hit. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, man. <laughs> Fuck you. I have a question, actually, about the Mikey plotline. Uh, we didn't see the dog all episode. Did he die after eating the Cheetos last yeah, episode? Yeah, he OD'd on the O's, bro. Jesus, that's Mike fucked up. Cheetos. Mikey killed his dog. <laughs> that's really upsetting. Uh, from a dog to a cat, Wildcat and uh, Stargirl <laughs> decide that their first mission together is going to be to go to the hospital, sneak and find out who has been visiting Brainwave while he's in a coma. Um, they go to the hospital. They see... Henry, she very quickly explains about Brainwave. Uh, the plan is basically Stargirl's going to sneak in one way while Wildcat climbs Just up the wall. Climbs up the wall. We've already talked about it this extensively, so we don't need to dwell on it again. It was uh, awful. She, you're wrong. Uh, she falls okay, down. She and knocks, then Beth saved the day, though, by showing up at the perfect time. She knocks off some bricks. Wildcat is hanging there. Beth shows up. She's got dinner for her parents, or for her Aww. mom at least, and distracts yeah. the security guard with enough time for Wildcat to sneak into Brainwave's room. Uh, meanwhile, Store Girl is in the store room. The staff starts to go nuts. What do you think was going on here? All right, since I speak Cosmic Staff, let me just tell you. Cosmic Staff was upset at Stargirl for trying to turn off the power in a hospital, which would murder people. So the Cosmic Staff was like, you know what? I'm sick of your shit. I'll make a distraction so that way we can cause a distraction so Wildcat can slowly uh, climb up a wall and uh, save the day, which is what they did. But which wasn't explained was how the fuck they got out of that closet because there wasn't a window where she could fly up and down in. Uh, I'm curious what the sort of power set of the Cosmic Staff is because we it feels sentient a little bit and it almost feels hyper aware, like it's aware of it's more than aware. just what's in the room. Um, mm-hmm. And it seems to have a sense of people in a, in a way that we don't quite understand. So... I'm very curious if we're going to find out about that and if that is going to play into sort of Starman and that mystery as well. Because it definitely feels like this scene, especially, there's a lot more going on with the staff than even what's in the comic books. I'm sure if she finally opens up their present from her father, it's an instruction book for the cosmic staff. Oh, my God. 
Uh, so meanwhile, Wildcat, as uh, the nurse is distracted by the Cosmic Staff's antics, Wildcat goes and gets the information that she needs for the computers. Uh, Beth, we get a brief scene of Beth visiting her mom. Uh, her mom says, you don't have to be here. You could be with your friends. And she says, you and dad are my best friends. Oh, Still, wow. Talk about a sad thing to hear a child say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but what was worse was the mom was like, no. Yeah. I, I still, I love this bit. Like, this is just such a yes. very clear bit with Beth and her parents, and I enjoy it quite a bit. Uh, Wildcat sneaks into Brainwave's hospital room, sees Henry. This is the moment we were talking about earlier. Pops out her claws, wants to slash him, but she can't do it. At which point the nurse comes in, uh, the nurse come or not the nurse comes in. She just jumps to the ceiling. Yeah. And Henry Cause leaves. Because he, uh, yeah. superpower is quiet jumping now, too. She added that on in there. Well, and I think she feels as for as much as she wants to hurt him, she feels bad that he's feeling bad about his dad. And I thought this is a nice a nice moment, especially from the fact that she was about to like maybe murder him by pulling her clothes. Yeah, straight out. up murder right. him. I think it's crazy. If there was a whole ass person hanging from the ceiling, I feel like I would notice them even if they were quiet. No. Nope. Yeah. I've no. uh, I've hovered above you many times. <laughs> and you <laughs> haven't noticed me once. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, Stargirl flies up to the window. Uh, very fun the way this is blocked, just her sitting on the cosmic staff. Uh, at which point, the principal of their school comes into Brainwave's room, starts playing the violin. She seems a little confused because nothing happens. We find out that very appropriately, her name is Principal Bowen, mm. because of course she plays the violin. Uh, and she's a super villain as well, they pretty much assume, and I think correctly assume. Um, yeah, but that's also something you should do if somebody's in a coma. You should get out a violin and play something really loud, obnoxious right in their face to be like, are you faking? And then if they don't move, you know they're really in a coma. What, what music would you think would pull you out of a coma? Oh, it really what depends instrument? on... I think it would be, you know, anything that's like, uh, you know, like... Metallica or, mm-hmm. you know, anything like that or any like kind a of, little POD maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just like really just kind of like some heavy metal style. that Puddle could like mud. Really, yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, wow. What about yeah. like, what about like, like uh, toadies? <laughs> nice. <laughs> just deep, deep cut, me, Alex. Yeah. That, <laughs> I, that blew me. I don't even know what toadies is. You know what toadies. They had a song that was you on know. the radio f- fucking all the time. It was that. <laughs> wow, how did it go? Um, it was uh, it was a song about like a vampire being a vampire, basically secretly. And it was like, yeah. "Do you want to like- die?" Oh yeah, I yeah, would, yeah. yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're ever in a coma or I think you're in a coma, Pete, I'll just play the Tony song for you. Uh, so Beth, at that point, as we mentioned, sees Yolanda and Stargirl together. Climbing the walls, they make because the one big superhero mistake here, which is Stargirl yeah, using, calls her. You know, yeah, not using code names. I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, they don't know. As there's a very fun moment Reckless. earlier on where uh, where Yolanda asks Courtney, is like, wait, how long have you been doing this? She's like, I don't yes. know, a week. Yeah. And I like, Which, how, how long did your dad train you? She's like, never, don't know him, never met him. <laughs> I thought that was really good. <laughs> So after this adventure, uh, Yolanda doesn't want to be Wildcat. She needs to get her life back before she becomes someone else. Courtney is bummed but understands. At which point we get this heartbreaking scene again. I uh, can't. Don't make us do it again. Yolanda confesses to her parents how she feels. The music is swelling. You think they're going to say, yes, we love you. And instead they say, no, you've betrayed this family. You've disgraced them. Go to your room. And it's awful, but... She ends up, uh, she goes to her room, she's cold, she sees Courtney left her the costume, says, I can't do this alone. She realizes somebody needs her. She puts it on and comes back to Courtney. And it was just, just the helmet. It wasn't even the full costume. It was the full, was costume. The full costume. The full costume was there. We just saw the helmet, though. Right, so she was just running around nude with a helmet in the middle of the street? Well, no, no I'm sure it was the costume eventually, but all we got to see was the helmet. Uh, I, I just can't <laughs> believe how three months ago she had an amazing family, and then, you know, a couple nude pics leak, and then all of a sudden you're dead to your whole family? Your whole family, though? 
I mean, sure. I, like I think her brother, her brother feels her like her brother was great. Like yeah. her brother was great, but what, what sucked was we didn't get her. Her fa- her brother put down the popcorn angry, but then he like went to his own room. He didn't go to uh, his sister's room to comfort her at all, which was a little disappointing. Yeah. Uh, well, regardless, though, uh, we now have two parts of the JSA together. Uh, she comes back to Courtney. We get the scene to Pat the end. And that's the end of the episode. Before we wrap up, though, who was the star of this week's episode? Justin? Ooh. I mean, I got to give it up to Wildcat, Yolanda. Like, the episode was built around her. And we she the, her story was told so smartly. We got to see... Uh, the peaks, the valleys, everything in between uh, of her going from being a happy teenager to a very unhappy person uh, dealing with a lot of just uh, being an outcast and then have this thing drop in her lap being a superhero. I thought she was great. Pete, what about you? Cosmic Staff is the only one who knows what's fucking going on and is not willing to shut off the power in a goddamn hospital. Why would you think that's okay? I'm also going to pick <laughs> Yolanda. I didn't know what to think about Yvette Montreal uh, in the first couple of episodes. She basically was the person who was like, get away from me. Leave me alone. And that was her only lines. But completely floored by the acting job that she did here. I love Wildcat as a character for the comics anyway. So I was nervously anticipating this, but I think she nailed it. And I'm excited to see her and Courtney going forward because I think honestly having her on the show as part of the team has made Courtney better as well. I I agree. It's great to have more people on the team. I just think that like if you can't do something in post that makes it look good, then let me in on the joke. Play some funky Batman type music in the background so I know this is a joke. It's a subtle it's not a joke, it's a subtle homage. It's an homage. It's not a bit. Well, it's was heartbreaking to watch because the action up until this episode has been fantastic. It dipped on this app. This is somehow more ludicrous than you talking about Pat's car for, I want to say, half an hour. Oh, my God. Did you see the shot, though, when he pulled up? That was real <laughs> nice. That was real nice. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out and chat Stargirl with us. Socially, Star Guys Pod on I not on iTunes, Star Guys Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the show. Leave us a comment on iTunes in particular. We appreciate those quite a bit. Comic Book Club Live.com for this podcast and more. And remember to fly high as a star guy. 